now to continue to try and understand um, the fire that, that devours them. We've just looked at um, Psalm 2, which also speaks of a rebellion, which in the, ends in the kindling of the wrath of the Messiah, um, which to me really reminds of Revelation 20, the rebellion also. It's very much for me a parallel. Um, and we are trying to find out what, how exactly is, is this rebellion ended. That's what we are all interested in. Um, and it's ended by this fire from God out of heaven, which I link to the wrath that is kindled from the Messiah. And we know that the fire um, is linked to, to his words or the truth, but it can also be linked to false fire because it's also linked to the second beast, which um, has fire that comes down from heaven in, in the sight of men. To me, there seems to be two systems, one connected with sort of an old form and then a new form, and this new one is connected to fire. So I'm going to show you uh, in my previous video on 1 Kings 13, which I obviously will link below, um, we've, we've got the, we will read it all later through again, but I'm just generally going to look there and tell you, you've also got that two systems. You've got the false altar, and this one is also linked to ashes, um, and incense, burning incense. And then you've got this old prophet, which was linked to a lion that killed the man of God. So again, you've got like an old system and a, and a new system. And um, the new one is connected to this fire. But before we go through that one again, let us look at another place where I also find this pattern. And then we, because I believe this is going to show us what exactly is the false fire. I think if we can see this, the systems, the, the hunters uh, that, that are sent against us, the two forms of the system, we will understand those words better. So in Ezekiel 19, um, I'm going to read that chapter, and there we again are going to see one system associated with lions and another one associated with fire and burning. When she saw that she waited, that her hope was lost, she took another of her cubs and made him a young lion. He roved among the lions and became a young lion. He learned to catch prey. He devoured men, he knew their desolate places and laid waste their cities. The land with its fullness was desolated by the noise of his roaring. Then the nation set against him from the provinces on every side and spread their net over him. He was trapped in their pit. They put him in a cage with chains and brought him to the king of Babylon they brought him in nets that his voice should no longer be heard on the mountains of Israel. Your mother was like a vine in your bloodline, planted by waters, fruitful and full of branches. Because of many waters, she had strong branches for scepters of rulers. She towered in stature above the thick branches and was seen in her height amid, amid the dense foliage, but she was plucked up in fury. She was cast down to the ground and the east wind dried her fruit. Her strong branches were broken and withered. The fire consumed them and now she is planted in the wilderness in a dry and thirsty land. Fire has come out of a rod of her branches and devoured her fruit, so that she has no strong branch, a scepter for ruling. 
This is a lamentation and has become a lamentation. So what we see here is very interesting. Um, we see here a mother, the mother, obviously speaking of Israel, their mother is a vine and that this vine um, was strong and she had uh, she, she had strong branches for scepters of rulers and towered in statue and was seen in her, her might, but then plucked up in fury, cast to the ground and destroyed. And it says the and it says the fire has come out from a rod of her branches. It says the fire has come out from a rod of her branches and devoured her fruit. So again, you see that fire devouring. And then she has no strong branch, a scepter for ruling. So we firstly, we see this mother that is basically this vine that just starts to grow and um, is a... Uh, a towers and uh, ha has many scepters for rulers. So it's almost like in um, the book of Daniel, where Daniel speaks also to Nebuchadnezzar and, and um, speaks to him that he became this huge, huge tree that basically all the nations, he covered all the nations um, under this tree. We see it here in Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, second dream. Um, he said the following, he said, this is what Nebuchadnezzar says, I was looking and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heaven dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the vision of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, chop down the tree and cut off its branches, strip, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. And then it goes on like, like that, basically. So it's very much the same obviously referring to the kingdom of Babylon, which is then um, compared to this tree that basically becomes so huge and it can be seen to the ends of the earth and everything is fed from it. So in this Ezekiel 19, you get the same type of thing with this mother, but she's a vine planted by waters and she her branches become rulers. So basically it's a tree that's got, that con, uh, consists, its branches are scepters of rulers. And she also becomes huge, this tree, um, but plucked up in fury and cast to the ground. And then the same type of destruction. But in this case, it's like a full destruction. It just says, it ends with, so that she has no strong branch, a scepter for ruling. So in this case, to me, it seems unlike with Daniel 4, where you've got this um, stump that's left. And we know about Nebuchadnezzar, he, he lived like an animal for seven years, but then his kingdom was restored to him, you see. In this one year, it just says there's no scepter. She has no strong branch. So it seems to be a total destruction. So this is also a 
a kingdom, but this is called the mother. Um, it's a kingdom that totally gets devoured by, by fire. That even comes from her, a rod from her branches. And then we also know that she is the mother. It's speaking here to Israel and then calls the mother this vine that gets devoured, but also says to Israel, your mother is a lioness. So we've got this other comparison. So we've got this one system of this mother that's this vine that goes on, that gets gets on itself on fire. And then you've also got the mother that's the lioness that raises the lion cubs. The one it was a hunter and then the nations trapped him and brought him down. So you've also got that idea of the rebellions of the nations against this, this young lion that's a hunter. And in the first case, this one is taken to Egypt, which reminds me of Israel. Now, Israel was taken in captivity to Assyria, but if you remember Joseph and and his father Jacob, and Jacob is Israel, they also were in Egypt, and eventually they were in captivity in Egypt. So to me, this first part reminds me a lot of um, Israel, Israel, the 10 tribes. And then the second one is the same. She does the same, but this one is again trapped by the nations um, and brought to the king of Babylon. Now we know Judah, the southern tribe, was taken into captivity into Babylon. So we can, we can see that um, you've got here the mother as a lioness and these lions, one was taken into captivity of Egypt and one in Babylon. To me, that represents Israel being scattered um, into Egypt and Babylon. Um, so there, what, what, catches my attention is this lion because to me that that corresponds to this old prophet that caused the death of the man of God through the means of this lion and the lion is a hunter so that's why I'm saying it seems to be like there's two systems that work um, and that we must be wary of. The one has to do with this fire, and the other one has got to do with Satan, the lion, the hunter. Because a lion hunts. And yeah, we see in uh, Genesis 10, Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the, be the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kalne, in the land of Shinar. From that land he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ur, Kalah, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kalah. Okay, so what we we see uh, associated with Nim, Nimrod is is Babel and Shinar, which is Babylon. So he is a hunter, and lions are hunters, and this mother is a lioness. So she is also a hunter, and this system of this lion. Um, that is hunting causes this um, that the nations then trap this lion. So it's all very interesting. The idea of the of Israel being scattered, but that they they were lions, and we know that the system became corrupt. Um, 
it became a Babylon of sorts. We read in Revelation of the destruction of Babylon. So the system becomes corrupt and then is destroyed by fire. And the system is connected to this hunting. And the hunting we see, like Nimrod, has got to do with creating uh, empires which basically are spiritually ba Babylon or Babel. In other words, men um, coming together and creating a massive system which becomes ungodly. Yes. And in some way, uh, Israel and Judah are involved in, in that, that they, it seems when they were in their land that they were also partaking of this hunt, this hunt. They were hunters. They were not um, fishers of men. We see here in Jeremiah 16, verse 16, a very interesting scripture. It says, Behold, I will send for many fishers, says the Lord, and they shall fish them. And after I will send many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. So this is referring also to Israel, that the Lord would send fishers and hunters. So we know that Jesus said he will make the disciples fishers of men. Um, so Christianity is associated with being fishers, but this hunters is another type. Uh, um, it's another system. And I'm thinking it's the system that has to do with this lion, which I believe uh, has to do with Babylon and Babel and Nimrod being a hunter, a system whereby... Um, men are hunted. It's a spiritual system where men are hunted rather than fished. I should say the fish fishing is uh, um, what we associate Christianity with. And then if the fishing doesn't work, then we've got this other system of hunting men. Um, and it seems to be associated with chains and bondage and rebellion of the nations. So that's very interesting. And it also ends with this fire coming down from heaven. So it's very much that Revelation 20 pattern of rebellion. It's just repeated twice. You've got the first young lion, the second young lion, and then the the vine that erupts in fire and destruction. Now, in 1 Kings 13, you see it in the opposite direction. Uh, you really should go watch my video on 1 Kings 13, named Don't Eat With That Old Prophet. Um, there I linked that when you turn from the um, apostatized form of Christianity, things like Roman Catholicism and the many apostatized denominations that we see that preach the greasy grace, uh, then you must be careful not to be caught by the lies of the old prophet and overcome by the lion which killed him. So I associated that with turning to legalism something like Hebrew roots or something like that, um, where you end up um, going back to a form of works. So, yeah, again, I see the two forms of Antichrist. The one form is a false altar that's got to do with false fire. We're going to look at this again. Um, and the other form is something that spiritually kills you. 
It's got to do with an old prophet and a lion, which we know the symbol of that is for Satan. And I believe that has got to do with the spiritual death caused by legalism. Now let's read again this chapter, 1 Kings 13. Um, if you have followed my teaching, you will have maybe watched that video. Uh, and I really recommend you first watch it before you listen to this teaching. But if not, let's read it again. Uh, so, because it's very important. 1 Kings 13. And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Then he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a child Josiah by name shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burnt on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, this is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart and the ashes on it shall be poured out. So it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God who cried out against the altar in Bethel that he stretched out his hand from the altar saying, Arrest him. Then his hand which he stretched out towards him withered so that he could not pull it back to himself. The altar also was split apart and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Then the king answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. So the man of God entreated the Lord and the king's hand was restored to him and became as before. Then the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. But the man of God said to the king, You, if you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall not eat bread nor drink water, nor return by the way you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. And then it's the part of the death of the man of God when he listens to the old prophet and is overcome by the lion, which I'm not going to look at now. I'm going to be focusing on this false altar. And it says, and after this event, after the man of God is killed by the lion due to the lying old prophet. It says, after this event, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but again he made priests from every, every class of people for the high places. Whoever wished, he consecrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. And this thing was the sin of the house of Jeroboam, so as to exterminate and destroy it from the face of the earth. So, this first altar is very interesting. And to me, the parallels are unmistakable to the Roman Catholic system, um, to in fact the whole false system that was set up of Christianity, not just the Roman Catholic. But the reason I say that is because Jeroboam, um, after the kingdom of David was torn in two, Jeroboam had the northern kingdom and he built a false altar because he was worried that when the people go to Jerusalem, to worship Jerusalem in the south where Judah was. He was worried that they would unify again and that they would um, then obviously turn against him. So he made this false altar and the Lord was against this altar and he sent this 
man of God to prophesy against it. Um, and it's very interesting that on this altar, he was, he was actually burning incense, which is also very much associated with the Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church. If you read this, it really, really reminds me a lot of the Roman Catholic system. The fact that it's split apart because the first the e the author the Eastern Orthodox and the Romans split. But I watched a video and the it was of an Orthodox priest and he explained that it's not that the church split in two. It's that the Roman part was in um, was basically uh, cut off as heretical because they started saying that the Pope is the head of the church and not the um, not Christ. So the Roman Church was in heresy and it was cut off. Now the, the thing about that, if you think that branch is basically cut off, all the Reformation came out of that branch, but that branch is cut off, you see, so it's got no life in it. And yeah, we see then again with the Reformation that it splits again. So the church splits again into the Roman Catholic and then the Protestant. So what I'm seeing is an altar that keeps splitting because if you look also then at the history after the Reformation, you got all the denominations. So every time you've got this altar, it seems to be splitting over and over again. And then we read here at the end, basically that the sin was making priests out of every class of people for the high places you ever wished. So it's a system where the king actually appoints priests priests and the system Jeroboam made was for political expediency anybody who wanted to could become a priest in other words it wasn't somebody that was anointed with the holy spirit it was um anybody that wanted to and obviously was willing to serve the king and that's exactly what we see also in the Roman Catholic Church and unfortunately later also in the Protestant system. Many pastors just serve the political system. And we can see here, it says there, this thing was the sin of the house of Jeroboam so as to exterminate and destroy it from the face of the earth. So you, you get the idea that the Lord actually used this thing to destroy that false system, that false altar, because remember, Israel was full of idolatry. So to me, I almost get the idea that this false altar, the idea of it was actually a that the Lord used it to destroy that idolatrous system from the face of the earth and now I can extrapolate to our time where we're actually seeing that the Roman Catholic Church is is being destroyed and it's going to take all the others that have bound itself in the ecumenical movement it's going to take it with it and be be destroyed we can also see yeah, where the man of God, or where the king Jeroboam um, actually stretched out his hand towards the man of God, that his hand actually um, withered. And I think what that, and that was when the altar was split apart. I think that withering hand also has application to when the Roman Catholic Church. Um, when it's when the Reformation come, when that split come, 
then the power of the Pope was withered because he was putting out his hand on the on those true servants of God that was um, rebuking him in those days. But they he was also he asked to be restored. So that to me is the restoration of the uh, power of the church. Um, I know they did restore the the papacy to power again after that. Um, but I also think it has application in in the fact that the Protestant movement then took over the, this power. Um, but yeah, we see that the man of God refused to eat with that system. So we must understand that the Protestant system came out of Roman Catholicism and it wasn't fully restored. So those that truly belonged to the Lord, they didn't find a home really in those denominations. They quickly became full of false doctrine and leaven again because you see the root was a the root was the Roman Catholic Church, which already was heretical. So this is what I'm seeing is is this thing of the the uh, power of the Roman Catholic Church being removed from it, and that this false altar keeps splitting. And as you can see, it had the ash. So the ash is after the fire that we read about in Revelation 20 and yeah, in Ezekiel 19 of this fire. It reminds me. So this altar opened and you could see that there was only ashes there. And why is the ashes there? Because of the false fire, because of burning incense, which is associated with idolatry. It's an idolatrous system. And it is connected to false fire that burns and then devours and destroys this false system. And it's got to do with a system that serves the political system and has priests that are made by the people, not anointed by the Holy Spirit of God. So that is what I think this false fire has to do with that we read. It's got to do with this false altar. It's got to do with false doctrine destroying this rebellion. But there's more to it than just that, because we know that there is also these, this lion and this other false system. And I see often people run from the one only to be overcome by the other. They run from the false system and then they fall into back from they fall from grace back into the legalistic system which is the lion that um devours them and you'll see yeah uh, if you go and read the part uh, the second part of the death of the man of god where he ate with this old prophet who lied to him you will see that the old prophet actually, it says, the old prophet came to mourn and bury the man of God and he laid the corpse in his own tomb. It says that he laid the corpse in his own tomb. So, and then it actually says a very interesting thing that the old prophet that lied to the man of God says, when I am dead, then bury me in the tomb where the man of God is buried. So they were buried together, you see. And I'm thinking this has got to do with dead, spiritual death. So this man of God landed in exactly the same place 
as the old prophet being of the spiritual dead. And then yeah, in Revelation 20, we see a parallel type of thing happen where it says the devil who deceived him was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. So that very much reminds me of the man of God that ended in the same grave as the old prophet who had deceived him. It's, it's almost a very um, parallel thing to me that they end up in the same place. Now, that was in the grave. This one is in the lake of fire, the second death. So there seems to me be two systems. One is like being spiritually dead, and it is connected to Satan, and it's connected to the old prophet and the lion, um, which I think may be connected to being under law, not to keep the law of God, but to try be saved by works of the law because we are told the letter kills. And it is a ministry of condemnation. And then I see this other system where it's got to do with false fire, a false altar, which I connect to Christianity being apostatized. Um, and that would fit in very well with this mother being a vine because Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. So it seems to me when there's a, and he, and he actually said, when you do not remain in the vine, then you'll become a dry branch. You'll be collected and thrown in the fire. So it's the same thing. Now, Jesus is the true vine, but there does seem to be when we, when, when Christianity apostatizes, it reminds me of the same thing, a vine which then actually becomes dry and thirsty and then there comes a fire out of it. And I'm thinking this fire um, which comes out is like Psalm 2, the wrath that kindles. We, say, we read in Psalm 2 at the end it says, um, if you do not kiss the son, in other words, submit to him, remain in him, then there will be wrath and that wrath will be kindled, which has to do with a fire. And I think that may have to do with this rod, which comes out and then sets the whole thing on fire. Fire has come out of a rod of her branches. So once this vine which is first planted by waters, fruitful, beautiful, just like Christianity was for thousands of years. Well, these two thousand, not the whole 2,000 years, but hundreds of years um, and a millennium, we are told, many rulers came, many kings ruled where they ruled on earth, but they were under the dominion of Christ ruling in heaven. But then we saw a plucking up in fury, which reminds me of this altar that split, which is like when the Roman Catholic Church first split off and then split again and its dominion was taken away. It, we can see it's not ruling on earth anymore. The Roman Catholic Church ruled the Western, um, whole Western civilization so, to such a point that many people had to flee to the new world um, because it was so, it was uh, persecuting the saints of God, just like Jeroboam yeah, put out his hand towards the man of God. And because of that, it was, God was against it and he split it apart. And then we've got this ashes and this destruction. In the same way I see yeah, that 
once this system is dry, there is something that comes out from the system to bring this fire. So Jesus told us the branches are collected, they are tied in bundles, and, and then they go to the fire. So you've got this, we actually now in this dry process, and there is going to come a fire from this rod of the branches that set, that's going to set this whole thing on fire. And I think this fire of this rod, because Jesus was called the, um, the rod of Jesse. He came from that rod that came a shoot of Jesse. So that tree was also cut off, but then Jesus came out of it. And he set up this system that was fruitful, but which then eventually also becomes dry. And this rod that's going to come out from without the system being Christianity, apostatized Christianity, this fiery rod is going to be, according to me, this false prophet or antichrist, which is going to make fire come down from heaven and devour this whole thing. This whole system is going to be devoured. So that to me explains the fire of God, which comes out of heaven and devours them. In some way, it's either going to be through truth or through the twisting of the word of God. The fire of God gets twisted by the false prophet and then devours. Um, it's possible that both outcomes are possible depending on whether the people repent or not. So in other words, if people repent, the fire that comes out of heaven is the truth and then it devours the enemies. But if people do not repent, then the fire that comes is the word of God that gets twisted into false doctrine, false fire, and then also devours. Yeah, in 2 Peter 3 from verse 14, we read, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these th things, which is the coming of the Lord, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless, and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. Also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do the rest of the scriptures. Um, okay, so I want to show you this, which says, twisting scripture to your own destruction. So I think when you twist scripture and you make false doctrine, you you obviously get destroyed. And I think that is the false fire which destroys you because you start to believe lies. And when you love the lie, then, and you do not love the truth, then the delusion, the great delusion comes upon you. So in 2 Thessalonians 2, we read of this um, falling away and this great delusion. It says there, now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled. Remember what Jesus kept saying, don't be terrified and we must be gathered. The focus is on gathering not scattering. Um, so the, in this time, the Lord is gathering us and we must not be scared. Otherwise, we are going to be um, susceptible to false doctrine and we're going to be scattered rather than get gathered. Okay, so do not be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by 
spirit or by word or by letter as from us as though the day of Christ had come let no one deceive you by any means for that they will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Now, what I just want to focus here is that before the day of the Lord comes, there is an apostasy because it says the day will not come unless the falling away comes first. So it's called the great apostasy. So you need this apostasy for this event to happen and that is part of the rebellion it's not just the secular world that is rebelling um, at the moment it is in the church also so there's rebellion also in the churches so yeah it says uh, about that delusion I want to speak about that. And again, yeah, it says, when the lawless one is revealed, when the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So again, we get that idea of fire from the mouth of the Lord, which is in Revelation 20, being destroyed by fire, which yeah, we see is associated with the breath of his mouth, meaning his word. His word, and we know that the sword of the spirit comes out of the mouth of the Lord in Revelation. So, yeah, it says the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So, again, yeah, we see this warning that there's going to be many signs and lying wonders that's why I keep warning don't be terrified by all these signs of the end times they keep showing you because Jesus said it's going to there is going to be all these signs and lying wonders yes you can see that they are happening and that's why he told us that they will happen all these these things but we must be careful to just be following and looking out for signs and then be deceived because that's exactly how Satan is going to deceive with this deception. And then it says there, because they don't love the truth, for this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness so yeah we read of the strong delusion that comes upon the people so that they believe this lie this false fire they believe this and this condemns them and I think it's not just the secular people it's in the the churches it's in all the religions all of them they are all following the false signs and wonders and they are all coming up in rebellion the whole world and we can actually see that okay and then yeah if I can go back to Peter where he, he says to us um also yeah I just want to point out how he says it takes a long time because that's salvation so that's why I'm telling you don't think everything's just going to happen suddenly and your the whole world is going to explode suddenly. I, 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 I can't be certain, but I don't think so. Because also Peter tells us he, it's done over time to give time for people to be saved. So there is time, but we mustn't. Um, now again be complacent we need to be searching the scriptures we need to be turning fully to the Lord we need to be laying down all our sinful and wicked ways and our unbelief and we need to be 
following Christ and obeying him because he said, if you love me, you will obey me. Relying on the righteousness of Christ and having faith and being saved by grace does not give you a pass to live lawlessly because if you have true faith, if you believe in him and if you love him, you will obey him. That is what belief is. Believing in him means you believe what he says. And so you do those things. And then he says, yeah, you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So, because you know of all these things, be very careful that you do not, um, as they say, go from the frying pan to the fire. Do not run away from the false altar, but be devoured by the lion of legal, legalism. It speaks here of our steadfastness. And in, in many of my previous studies, I link the steadfastness to being spiritually mature, to not being blown about by every wind of doctrine. And our anchor is Jesus, and he is the rock who doesn't change. So we need to be anchored in him, and we need to have our righteousness in him. We mustn't be lawless and abuse the grace of God to live lasciviously and live a life that where we don't look at all like his child because we will not enter the kingdom of heaven and we will be led away with the error of the wicked. We will, for example, side with the people in the secular world and start believing in um, humanism. On the other hand, we must not be led away with the error of the wicked where we believe the lies of the old prophet that wants to bury us in his grave so that we are the dead, that we again are dead. Um, and we are in a system which existed at the time of Jesus Christ, which was those Pharisees, uh, Pharisee system that he had, that he, that had had all sorts of heavy burdens on the people, but secretly they are worshipping false gods with their mystery religion because they've got the outer religion where they put the people under the heavy law, but inwardly that they have... Um, secret teachings um, that are called Mystery Babylon that because they come from Babylon. So it's all sorts of mysteries and, and hidden things. Now the Holy Spirit can show you the hidden deep things in the scripture, but your faith must not be based on mysteries. Um, remember Jesus said when they say to you I'm in the secret rooms or I'm in the wilderness don't go the secret rooms is when we base our faith on knowledge and on mysteries on the other hand the wilderness means legalism and law keeping where, they, where it's dry there is no water there there's no spirit there it's all just about following work, dead works so that would be the wilderness Jesus is not there why do you seek the living among the dead we need to walk in that narrow way not turn to the left not turn to the right the left is being lawless, siding with a secular world and, and standing on human rights and, and, and that type of thing. The right is turning to religion and having religious doctrines. For example, Zionism is one example, only one example. But there are many such systems where it's all about your own works 
Um, and, and that system can also be political. Both systems have a political wing because it's an evil, wicked bird with two wings. We are not to be of that two-headed bird that has a left and a right. Our head must be Jesus. And then we can have the mind of Christ and he can help us just like Moses helped them go through the Red Sea when when there, there was a dry path open for them. The water stood to the left and to the right and they were able to go through in the same way. For us, we, we need to find the, um, the narrow path, the path that leads to love. So the fire is going to be doctrine. It's going to be the doctrine that destroys us, that either restores us or destroys us. Um, and either way, the, this, no matter what happens, Peter tells us to focus on the Lord and he will look after us, whether whether the people turn back and are restored and or whether the system goes down, it's irrelevant. And um, if it goes down, it will be because the Lord is going to restore it because there are so many dry, dead branches in this massive vine that is towering over this earth that it is a time for it to be renewed. Just like it was 2,000 years ago when John the Baptist said the axe was already laid at the root and that system was cut down. We are at a time like that. And it's not, got, we, we don't, it's not for us. There's nothing we can really do to change it. It will depend on the masses of the people. But what we can do is not be deceived and we can help each other and we can stand steadfast and not out of fear um, side with either side who are both sides not right. If you find yourself in a camp where there are many, then you must ask yourself why. For example, at the moment, I'm finding myself in agreement with many who say we are faith, saved by faith. And that always rings a bell of alarm for me. But if I tell those same people who agree with me we are saved by faith, if I, for example, say to them that the, um, the festivals you are celebrating uh, are pagan, they won't agree with me on that, you see? Um, and the other group, again, they may agree with me that, for example, Easter has pagan roots, um, but they will fiercely, fiercely fight against we are saved by grace. So in both cases, I am left out in the open, if I can put it that way, and therefore we should find our shelter among the Lord because we are not going to be among the many. Uh, we read in the Bible, it says with Jesus, he was counted among the transgressors. And if you think of the cross, there are three crosses Jesus being innocent in the middle, but you had the man on the left and the man on the right. So three men were crucified. Three. One, the one on the right hand, he did repent. The other one he did not repent. Um, so it's very interesting, but the way of the Lord is, is that narrow path. Um, and we are not going to find many agree if we want to stand on the word of God.